Thank you. Um, next on the agenda is the safety and security updates, Tony. Sure, can everybody hear me? Good, thank you. Hi, right, greetings everyone. Um, so for the month of May, <clears throat> we've, we've done well again. I know the pandemic has some influence on the crime numbers, um, but we've also uh, really dropped the numbers, um, especially in the um, shoplifting department, which is driving our crime astronomically up between uh, CVS and Charles, uh, Charles and 25th to 2511 at the uh, dollar store. Um, I know our, our numbers are going off the roof with that. So uh, we were fortunate enough to touch base with the um, corporate security and uh, and they've kind of taken care of it. They actually put a security guard down in, on Green Mount Avenue and, and they've, they've done a lot of things up with CVS also. So in March, total crimes in CVCBD was 63. In April, went to 30 and the month of May, we have 27 crimes. So, I mean, it, it's a big reduction in, in what we're doing. And if you have any, any questions about the category of crimes, just let me know. So Harwood, <coughs> excuse me, Harwood, I'll go down real quick. I think you have like 10 of them. Um, you have a burglary, 3010 Greenmount Avenue. It's a rooftop burglary, and that raised my concern because there was, like last year, there was a couple of rooftop burglaries. Um, but that's the only one we have, and that was on the second. And on the third, we had an unarmed robbery in the 7-Eleven store on um, 33rd Street. And it was kind of upsetting because it wasn't just a regular armed robbery. It was a shoplifting. Uh, he was confronted, and this gentleman began to uh, strike the attendant, the store attendant, and also started throwing property around and breaking items in the store. He fled the scene. Um, I, I kept in touch with Northern District about this one, and they finally have identified the uh, gentleman who uh, did this, the suspect who did this. They have identification on that. They have to get the uh, criminal summons for him. I've stolen auto, 2800 block Green Mount Avenue. It's 2007 Infinity. Um, keys were left inside a running vehicle. If someone jumped in and took off with that. First was issued a citation. Burglary at the uh, 401 East 33rd, the rear door. They pried the rear door open to Peabody Heights Brewery. I think we talked about this the last time. There's been uh, three burglaries in a month there, in a month period of time, 30 day time. And uh, recently today doing a follow up. Um, and we, we, I visited there numerous times talking about um, ways to prevent this. The police department came with me um, and we talked about his vulnerable areas. Um, so as of today, I think it's a matter of days before all his, um, alarms, lights, and cameras will go into effect. So that's, that's huge for us there in that area because they, the first two times they hit the same double door and then this last time here, they used the pry tool. They got in and, uh, they just took some, uh, beer. So, um, further down. There's also a burglary across uh, 424 uh, East 30th Street. The victim says she hasn't been to the church in about four weeks and does not know if any property is missing, but she wrote a burglary report. Another uh, larceny shoplifting, 400 East 29th Street. This is the Salvation Army store. We've since identified the lady that went in there. She went in the first time, she started putting product, trying to conceal product. Uh, they asked her to leave. Came back in the second time, same day with the gym bag. So they called the police, and because she came back in the second time with the gym bag, the police had a criminal summons for her. Um, Larsty from Auto, 400. Hey, Tony, I just want to say one thing. What's really important is Salvation Army should make clear that they have multiple missions, and one is that people who are in need can get the food product for free, so they don't need to go in there and steal it. They mm -hmm. can talk to the management and get food so and other products. So maybe that's a matter of communication because it would be sad to see a, a, a criminal issue arise when someone didn't understand that they need to talk to the management because they can get the food for free. There's a secondary mission. Yeah, so I'll follow up with that. That's great. Thank you, Tony. 
I, I think the reason that uh, they got the criminal summons on this one was when she came in with a gym bag, she was putting a lot of product in that gym bag. It wasn't it. one bottle of, you know, it was not, not just for her. Got it. If it's not just for her, that's not what they do. Yep. It's for, it's for the consumer. Okay. Um, 2,500 block Greenmount Avenue, the police recover, uh, I, um, was arrested a suspect with a 40 caliber handgun in it with 11 rounds. That was on the 13th. Another larceny, 2,600 block Greenmount that was inside. Um, and then, um, <laughs> I shot myself in the foot with this one. We had the uh, three carjackings with the young juveniles and the help of uh, a resident sending me pictures of the second carjacking. Um, they were taken into custody and then they did their third carjacking in CBCBD. And um, they, were, they were stopped there over in the Eastern District. And two of the people who did the Able Street carjacking was um, a, a taken into custody in the Eastern District for that carjacking. Since then, there's been no juvenile carjackings, but there was a carjacking on the 21st. It was at the uh, gas station at 501 East 33rd Street. Um, it was a um, rental car with Virginia tags. Gentleman got out, went over to the um, storefront, and the person was sitting in the passenger side, was sitting there, and the suspect came up, opened the driver's side door, produced a handgun, and said, get out of the vehicle. At this point, and, and the person got out of the vehicle, at this point, there's no uh, follow-up in the investigation where they have any people of interest in this investigation. Um, another burglary, 309 uh, Greenmount Avenue, property taken was hand sanitizer, uh, damaged the side window, um, got in, gained entry to St. John's Episcopal Church once inside, uh, they damaged property, removed the items, the TV, and hand sanitizer for that. And then last but not least, there was a, another handgun violation. person stopped, was caught with a revolver, Smith & Wesson revolver, and a suspect who was placed under arrest, 3300 Bucket Greenmount Avenue. One more thing I'd like to say, if I can, is we did a, uh, a breakdown of uh, from 2019, from 318-19 to 516-19 verse, 2020, 318 to 516, the COVID period, time period frame. But with the by post is uh, firearms were used in crimes 30 times compared to uh, in 2019, compared to 2020, 21 times. A knife was used in 2019, six times compared to seven times in, in 2020. So the numbers are, are, are going down in, in a good way. They're going down with the crime and a type of crime, and the police are in the area making the, the, the needed arrest for handguns. So, and I think that with Peabody getting their systems up and running this week, I think we're looking in a, in a positive direction with crime. Anything else, Tony? No, sir. Cool, I, I wanna, Can I ask Tony a quick question? Absolutely. Charlene, for the, you said, I think you said a carjacking at a gas station at 501 East 33rd? Right. What gas station is that? I think it was the Crown Station. Okay. All right, that's it. Thank you. Um, real quick, just a, an, another thing, too. If, if you have something, do you see something suspicious or you don't, uh, you, you have questions about it or issues with it? Um, there was issues about, you know, a DOA or a person of interest of maybe um, <clears throat> food behavior or um, window shooting. It came as a window shooting and it wasn't a, a show. I've researched that also. Um, please, please email me, Tony at charlesvillage.org as soon as you can. As soon as you email me, then I can get right on it and start making calls and start the investigation. One of the problems I have is the hit and run at Guilford was the midnight shift handled it. And um, so I had to wait till 11.30 at night to contact the midnight shift about. So if you have any questions or any incidents, email me and I'll try to get your email back right away. And that way it'll expedite my investigation into it. Was that, was that the hit and run at 29th and Guilford? Yes. Okay. Yes. One of the suspects had a warrant and he had drugs on, um, but they uh, did not charge for the drugs. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Tony? 
All right. Well, I would like to introduce Gina Clay. She's the new Northern District Community Liaison. Uh, she wanted to say a few words. Gina, go ahead and take it away. Gina, I think you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Yeah. She also sent a message that came across that just said this is an encrypted message. So I'm not sure if she's having issues. Mm. Um, Tony, do you have Gina's number that you could like contact her outside of the? Yes, yes. I'll do it now. Thank you. We'll just bump her to the to the end. Gina, okay. we're going to bump you to the end if you can hear us. Um, I'll, I'll let her know. All right. Thank okay. you. Uh, Thanks, next Tony. up. Next up, we've got community reports and discussion. Uh, first on that list is the Traffic Calming Slow Streets Project. Um, Miller Roberts is going to give a quick introduction, and then Eli, uh, Eli is going to talk a little bit more about the outreach that's been done in the community. Uh, Miller, do you want to start with that? Um, sure. So I think what you wanted me to just talk about is that City Council introduced um, some legislation that uh, because of COVID-19 wanting to make for more space for people to ex be able to exercise and get out. Uh, and since a lot of us aren't really driving places, they are trying to come up with a plan to slow streets. Uh, and it's gonna be a neighborhood organized effort for the most part because the Department of Transportation is concerned that they don't have the manpower or the funds to do all of the work for as many streets as people would like closed. I think that you have seen through the city, uh, there are some areas they have taken care of, like around Lake Montebello, there's some places downtown, I think also around Patterson Park, to allow people to have more space to walk and you know keep distancing. So uh, part of what a lot of neighborhoods are doing right now is looking at their street inventory and saying, are there streets that would make sense to be slowed and I think that there, there's there been some conversation earlier just about some various streets that people would like to see slowed. Um, and I think Eli has started the heavy lifting um, to look at what would make sense for Harwood slash Charles Village. And I think there's some discussion uh, in a CVCA committee that will take place as well. So Eli, I'll turn that over to you. Sounds good. Thank you, uh, Miller, for uh, for sharing that uh, introduction. I actually have slides, so I'm going to go ahead and share my uh, share my screen if that's all right. Um, uh, let me see. Um, uh, here we go. Uh, cool. Does everyone see the uh, uh, the slides that? Uh, yes. That pulled up. Okay. Cool. Those are great. Um, yes. So um, so just very briefly, I mean, Miller already shared some of this, but I'll just uh, very quickly, the idea, um, the city council bill refers to what, what are called shared streets, but they've also been called slow streets in other uh, cities. And the idea is that to, to not close a street to cars or traffic, but just reduce the volume and get the speed slow enough so that people can safely walk, bike, or run um, in the street um, to relieve potential congestion or concern over congestion on the uh, on the sidewalks. And so one reason to propose this for Guilford rather than say Barclay or Greenmount is that the sort of general best pol best practices right now are to to use this on on streets that already have a low volume of vehicles and low to moderate speeds. Um, and the way that this is working in other cities is that it's usually using a combination of some uh, basic signage or barriers at the um, sort of uh, uh, ends of blocks where vehicles may be entering a street. So they'll have to sort of pause, see a sign, try to travel around, um, and then sometimes also markings on the pavement themselves, often either temporary with sort of spray, paint, spray chalk or um, using spray paint that could be uh, sort of cleaned off later. Um, so a couple of quick examples. Um, this is what the slow streets look like in um, Seattle, Washington, where they call them stay healthy streets. And you can see they're also using the signage to, uh, um, to share information about um, uh, the need for physical distancing. And the sort of same thing in uh, Oakland, which is, I think was one of the first cities to, to sort of um, uh, implement this in a bunch of different neighborhoods all, all at once. Um, and then the pilot that Miller alluded to. Uh, so conference call. 
in uh, okay, in Baltimore nice. is uh, a closure around Lake Montebello and then a, um, a partial closure still open to local traffic of Linwood uh, Avenue, which is the street that separates the sort of two halves of, uh, of Patterson Park. So we figured that the best place to start was to get some feedback from um, residents on the idea of um, slowing traffic on, uh, on Guilford. And, and it was, I think, fortunate that a lot of other uh, ideas and, and questions came out in that discussion. So just very briefly, some background is that we, I think on like May 14th, they got emailed out to the Harvard Community Association email list. And then um, we shared it on Facebook and Nextdoor and to, um, uh, I sent it to sort of a bunch of different neighbors, especially on Guilford that I had contact information for. And then we also posted posters uh, up and down both Guilford and Barclay to try to reach people that way as, as well. Um, and then shared a few reminders on on Saturday that we we're sort of closing the survey results for this uh, 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 for this meeting today. So we got um, excluding um, duplicates. We actually got one person who I don't know whether they sort of misunderstood that the intent of the survey was sort of one response per person, but they submitted 31 responses that seemed to be clearly from the same individual. So I sort of uh, included one of those responses, but excluded the others. Um, and then all told, we've got 131 responses, 70 three of those came from folks who are identifying their block of residence was either in Harwood or because I know the line cuts right down the middle of Guilford it's possible they're just like you know right outside of Harwood depending on how you want to sort of um, be particular about it and um, uh, about four in ten were Guilford Avenue residents um, and so you can see I made just like a quick chart you can see all of the different streets um, of course some of them with just like one one resident but uh, in Guilford uh, Whitridge Lorraine and 27th having the the most of all of them and then for Guilford, you can see the, the most responses were really for the area within Harwood where we were focusing our outreach between the 2900 block and the 2500 block. And so you see the block numbers along the side there. Um, so we asked a few questions. It was modeled on a survey that actually had been done in Denver by a sort of uh, walking and biking uh, advocacy organization there that they conducted before uh, starting uh, sur uh, their Slow Streets program. But so um, similar to what they found in Denver, um, uh, residents who responded to the survey reported um, that a significant number of them were walking much more uh, more than before the uh, uh, stay at home orders. Um, although a substantial number were saying same as before. I know one person who said less than before noted that they uh, were walking less than before out of concern of sort of encounters with other people and uh, worries over the um, their desire to maintain physical distancing. Um, so we asked rather than, uh, so we were trying to make sure the question was clear of what we were asking folks. So how do you feel about making Guilford Avenue a slow street by using a temporary barrier to discourage through traffic? And um, overwhelmingly, uh, the people who responded to the survey um, were in favor of, uh, sort of said that they were generally supportive of this proposal. I'd say that this is, this is definitely indicates that there is substantial support support among uh, uh, neighborhood and area residents, but I think it also indicates that this is likely, um, which it never really could or was intended to be, a wholly representative survey. So, um, so presumably there are some people who are less concerned or interested who just decided not to take the survey, as well as the sort of limits of having an online only survey or having just any kind of community outreach during this current moment sort of, um, uh, but you know, overall, I think sort of confirmed that there is a lot of interest and support uh, for this. I think the most interesting thing for just to sort of like try to uh, uh, get to a chance for discussion as, as I go through these in part just because there may be folks who some of the folks who shared these comments may be like participating in the meeting so feel free to like you know stop me so we can just talk about some of these as, as we go. Um, I also pulled out some of the more critical or um, uh, concerned comments rather than the ones that were just kind of like supportive of which we got a lot but I think it's it's important to take the questions and concerns very seriously. Um, so uh, 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 some, to summarize the sort of key points that were brought up more than one time in, in the comments were um, uh, people who responded with an interest in seeing traffic calming measures extended either north of 29th Street or south of 25th Street. Um, a very notable interest in additional traffic calming and reduced speeding on 27th, 28th, and 29th Street, as well as Barclay. Um, 
Concern that signage alone might not be a, uh, effective at reducing speeding. Uh, concern too, uh, I'd add to that of the um, the replacement of the older, um, the prior uh, speed bumps on Guilford Avenue, and uh, feeling that the replacement of those speed bumps has has diminished the ability of uh, of those to to calm traffic. Um, so you can see just as an example of like a resident on Guilford saying that they would like a slow, slower street so we can feel safer getting outside at a safe distance from our neighbors. So. Um, uh, some contrasting views from neighboring from other neighborhoods. So two Barclay residents uh, responding. So one person asking if this passes, please include the 2400 block. Um, uh, and another person uh, 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 saying sort of from 25th down to the city building in North Avenue would also be a great slow street. Um, uh, but then someone else uh, noting that um, they felt like Barclay uh, and other neighborhoods would have their commutes, their attempts to get to grocery stores and other daily activities directly affected and were commenting uh, uh, to share their, their not supporting uh, this proposal. Um, uh, other folks specifically noted 27th Street as a uh, as another opportunity for a, a slow street, and I'll, I'll mention the Greater Remington Improvement Association has also specifically request sent a letter to DOT already requesting uh, 27th Street, among other uh, streets in their neighborhood, be turned into a, a, a slow street. So that um, that is something that I think would be worth considering. Um, and then uh, uh, I wanted to just mention in particular because of the 26th Street Green um, uh, uh, came up a few times, particularly for folks who reported their residence as the 300 block of East 26th Street and worries about being making sure that they were still going to be access, be able to access their street and concern that traffic coming on Guilford could divert sort of high speed traffic to Barclay Street. And, um, so just for one instance, someone who said that they support traffic coming on Guilford only if it happens on Barclay as well. Um, I'll note, I went out and did some actual um, timing of the light cycles um, on 28th and 29th at both uh, uh, Guilford and Barclay and found that they're currently giving a 60 second green light for uh, the traffic on uh, east-west traffic on 28th and 29th, which is actually about a, a full third longer than is currently recommended in the city's uh, admittedly draft complete street guidelines. So potentially uh, we could advocate that DOT adjust light timing on those on Barclay 28th and 29th streets to reduce speeding, not just this sort of like addition of signs. So as Miller mentioned, there's a, a city council bill um, that was sent to the mayor on May 18th and is still sort of awaiting sort of either his signature or um, potentially a veto. I don't know if he's waiting for, for the results of the, uh, the election tomorrow before making a decision on that. Um, I'd also wanted to note that there uh, is generally recommendations based on the experiences in other cities to avoid um, police-based enforcement of any kind of physical distancing guidelines or other uh, policies related to uh, uh, to uh, slow streets and that the sort of management of any signage or barriers can often be um, volunteer residents can often take on a, a sort of important role in doing that. So, um, and that there are sort of perhaps opportunities to coordinate with some of the other neighborhoods in the area. So, um, so hopefully I didn't go into like uh, uh, too much uh, uh, detail or, or anything like that, but I'm happy to uh, um, uh, happy to uh, talk more more about any of those things if anyone has any sort of questions or comments or uh, uh, thoughts of any kind. Great presentation, Eli. Thank you so much for wrapping up um, those comments. That's really, really nice work. Yeah, I appreciate the, the legwork you've done on that, timing the lights and all this stuff. Uh, thanks. I have a question. Can you hear me? Oh, yep, yep. shoot. Um, the signage and like uh, at best the road cones are temporary and easily movable who who's responsible if this does get put in place and then you know some some people aren't having it and they just and they just move the cones themselves who, what is that going to be in, enforced is there going to be like follow-up after they're implemented for like uh, maintenance and that sort of thing so what other cities have have uh, done, and of course Baltimore hasn't sort of this is all kind of 
you know, if we send a, I, I will say DOT has not responded to the Greater Remington Improvement Association's letter, even though that was sent a couple of weeks ago. So DOT has not yet embraced this as a policy, even though other cities have. In cities that are doing this, generally what they've done is for the sort of like first week or two, their um, uh, city staff are checking uh, to make sure barriers are not being moved, to make sure uh, if barriers go missing that they're replaced. Um, they've found that if there are initial sort of issues that generally they've been able to sort of like engage residents and make sure everyone knows what's going on that these are supposed to be there um, and then that has at, at least according to what I've read sort of helped to resolve the issue um, I think it's also been generally well received in cities where it has been rolled out and so there's a fair amount of like just eyes on the street and resident stewardship over over the barrier so um, I think I, I tried to look for we did get one comment that was requesting that if this is rolled out that it only take place on a sort of like um, certain times of the day, not throughout the day. I'll say in most cities, as, as far as I know, it's being done throughout daylight hours, if not 24 seven. Um, but I, I didn't find a ton of detail on sort of like whether these barriers are being stored at night um, uh, inside people's houses or anything like that on any kind of routine basis. So hopefully that answers, answers your question. Yeah, that's great, Eli. Thank you so much. I'm really excited for this. Hey, Eli, I got a couple, two, two quick comments. One, um, I do think that if people are looking at a pedestrian and a community promenade along Guilford, I have for a long time also supported and done tremendous amounts of work to plant trees and make also Barclay a key pedestrian promenade. I think that if it's at all possible, having at least part of Barclay Street be part of the proposal would be great. I think Barclay and Guilford could make maybe a little bit too large of a target, but at the same time, I would hate to see what I see as really sort of a central promenade for much of Harwood going right up into Abel um, be missed. And uh, so, um, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking even with a longer term perspective on Barclay should be safe for everybody. That's been one of my long term objectives. Guilford should be safe for everybody. Um, and then also, I think you got it that <clears throat> trying to communicate with the surrounding communities is really important. So we tell everybody what we're doing. If people are trying to do uh, a street closure, even temporary, and I, I do think sometimes these things get like longer legs. It's great to talk with the surrounding communities. I did hear you said that part of um, Barclay w w was concerned about the transportation. Let's see that as an opportunity to open the dialogue about what do they want, because maybe actually this is something they do want, including perhaps even your mention of the 2400 block of Guilford. I know there's like a shift at 25th Street well, let's talk to them about what they want and see what the um, real objectives are. Because realistically, I think if everyone's in a dialogue and we get a really good outcome and we do some real building to get towards our, our, our longer term objectives as well. So anyway, thank you for bringing this to everybody. I just thought I'd share those, those points as well because I'm, I'm sure you've heard them from a few others, but um, uh, I, I did ask earlier if, if, if people beyond the Harwood boundaries should respond and it seemed no, but at the same time, I think we should have a larger dialogue to make sure everyone's like in on the same page, north, south, east, west, and we get something that um, is really gonna make, uh, I, I would consider not just a, a temporary, but more of a, a, a lasting impact. And thank you. Hi, Eli. This is Leslie. I just have a quick question on your thoughts. If uh, they were to decide to close part of Guilford or Barclay Dam, considering East Lorraine and East 26 are trafficked one way, how that would be impacted or how to mitigate some of those concerns? Yeah, I, 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 and I would say that like some of these, I think it's a really good question. I hesitate to offer sort of a, um, 
any kind of like real answer just because it's I do think that like our role as a community association at this point may be to say something like we you know coming out of t tonight's meeting we might want to say like we think that there's a lot of support among residents for um, uh, turning Guilford Avenue into a shared street there's interest in seeing Barclay also be considered for this and we're concerned about making sure that the you know one-way side streets and intersections with one-way side streets are handled in ways that are like safe and uh, appropriate however the sort of like the city's transportation planners may recommend and that we would ask like if this actually became a reality that they would come back to us with plans because like i mean i could throw out some ideas of, oh put signs here put signs there but i don't want to play amateur traffic planner over something that you know as of yet is more an idea than a reality Oh, that's great because I was just wondering because I know we see a lot of different um, types of service vehicles coming in and down the street, so we don't want to not prevent them from, I guess, doing their job. I do. I do think that I can. Uh, 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 back up and show real quick my one concern about the way the city handled the uh, the uh, local traffic uh, uh, this at um, uh, Linwood uh, on the left side of the image when I first saw that to me it looked like a full street closure and I was like whoa what is uh, is this is this what they're they're the approach that they're taking now the, you can see where it says road closed it actually does say local traffic only under that but I do I, there's certainly a concern that we have both MTA um, uh, mobility um, uh, service and FedEx trucks and UPS trucks and other larger vehicles that, um, you know, the, I think that it would be, this is, this has been well received in other neighborhoods uh, or, or other cities because it has not interfered with people's ability to get to work and run errands and uh, receive deliveries. And if the city tries to install barriers that do interfere with people's ability to safe for you know, delivery drivers to safely navigate the streets and get folks their packages in a timely manner. I don't think that's something that people would want to, you know, that would that would not be a popular uh, uh, program. So, uh, um, so yeah, I think it's a good question. Uh, figuring out sort of the best approach is uh, a sort of we'll see uh, uh, kind of thing. I think it's also think very important to note that it's the, the roads are closed to through traffic, not necessarily closed. Um, uh, that's a very important distinction. Um, you know, if you live in that area, you can still use those roads um, and you'll be able to get past the signs. The signs won't be physical barriers that are taking up the entire road. Um, you should be able to get past them. You'll have to slow down immensely to do it, but that's kind of the idea. Um, I think we need to move on, Eli. I, I really appreciate all the work you put in with that, but we do have a lot of other things that we wanted to cover. Of course, yeah. Um, Hey, Next. Can, I, can I throw in one quick thing? If, if we could just oh, clarify no. going forward, visits from family members, if I had a family member who wanted to visit, I know that's not in the list of things that are allowed, that would be one I'd be sensitive over. I, if, if I could see a family member, I'd want them to be able to visit. So if there's a way to clarify the, the, what the road is closed for, that would be great. I just noticed that was kind of missing from the legislation. Don't want to tie it up here touch base with me later, that'd be great. If I had a relative who wanted to see me, that would be something I'd want not prohibited. And there's nowhere for them to go but to pull on my street and park. So anyway, that said, keep moving. All right, um, next up on the list is uh, the June primary, which your ballots are due tomorrow. Um, the, they did open up 10 new drop-off locations due to the ballots not coming out in a timely manner. Um, the closest locations that I've been informed of are the Northwood Elementary on Lock Raven or the UMB's Outreach Center on Baltimore Street for the uh, drop-off locations. I understand there are some uh, in-person locations as well that you can uh, vote at tomorrow. Um, There's a drop box in Hamden, which I think is the closest. Okay, thanks. There's one in Hamden as well. There, there are 15 locations now scattered throughout the city. Um, so please, you know, do your civic duty and vote. Um, next up on the list is the census 2020. Um, you have until August 11th to self report. That's when the census bureau workers will come around and start knocking on your and your neighbor's doors. Um, so please fill out the census bureau uh, information. It's 2020census.gov 
It takes less than 10 minutes, even if you have a large household. I mean, it's really, really important that we get everybody counted um, and we get the, uh, the amount of money that, you know, for each resident. Um, I was on a call earlier this week and they, they estimate that it's about $18,000 in funding that we lose for every, every individual that doesn't get counted. So, you know, when we, we're, we're struggling to get funds, this is a very, very easy way to ensure that for the next 10 years that we're getting the correct amount of funding. So please uh, reach out to your neighbors, reach out to the other people on your street, make sure that people are getting that census information filled out and filled out ac accurately. Um, Next up on the list uh, is the Butterfly Project. Uh, Tamara Payne, I'm sure a few of all, a few of you all are aware um, that she has done some some murals throughout, some butterfly murals throughout the neighborhood. Um, they're mosaic projects that she works on. Um, she's going to continue that project. Uh, if you are interested in your house being a part of that, uh, please reach out to her. Um, and she will get some butterflies put on your house. Next is a community garden update. Um, we are really struggling to, with the city to get our water access turned on, which is very frustrating. Um, we've been very blessed that one of our neighbors is allowing us to use their, uh, their water, but at some point the, the bill is just gonna kind of be outrageous and not worth it. So. Uh, I'm um, working with our council people to see if we can get that resolved. Hopefully, um, we get that resolved soon. We did plan. Have you spoken with Nakia Mack? I haven't. Um, Keith, Keith, can I give an update? So I talked to Kathy this morning. She said that um, they were going to call and ask them to come turn the water on tomorrow. Okay. So Excellent. Look I appreciate until the end of the week. Um, I, I just think that that program, they're not because everyone's at home, they're not doing their normal due diligence. So she said he was gonna call in to ask the water department to just turn it off. Yeah, I mean, it's, it it's really puts us behind the eight ball if we don't have water. Um, if we can get our water turned on at the site, we will be looking for volunteers to sign up for one day a week to kind of be their day to, to be on site and water. Um, if you would like to be involved with that, I know Eli uh, volunteered last time um, just reach out to me and let me know if you'd like to be a part of that. Um, even if you don't know how to water, we'll do a little training session to, to get you up to speed on, you know, how to water or, you know, exactly what you need to be doing when you're there. Um, the other thing, a lot of people ask me what, what they can do to help out, you know, when they stop by. And the two biggest things that I, I spend most of my time doing are picking up trash and, uh, and picking weeds out of the beds. So if, if you're looking for something to do and you're at the community garden, those are the two things that I spend most of my time doing, picking up trash and picking weeds. It's not glorious, but uh, it's, it's part of the job. Um, next up, we have CBCA updates from Miller. Sure, so exciting. Um, the CVCA general meeting was virtual, their first one. I thought it was successful. It's recorded if you wanna go back and listen to it. I believe that uh, it's been posted on the website. Uh, important things that came up during the meeting. One, the board member nominations are open if you wanna get involved and I hope you all wanna get involved with CVCA. Um, there's a process for being put up for nomination to be on the board. If you don't want to be on the board, but still want to get involved, consider joining a committee. There are several different committees that you could join and help out. Um, and right now, a lot of the activities, as you all know, are canceled because of what we have with COVID-19. And I, the, the committee that plans a number of the activities is looking to find some creative ways to have some smaller uh, responsible gatherings. So be on the lookout for that information. Um, I, I think that Kyle can talk about the 26th Street Green because that was the exciting topic um, during uh, the meeting. So I'll let him talk about that. Sure, I'll just give you a brief update. So we, um, Megan, uh, my partner, uh, and also the president of the, of the 26th Street Green, the new friends of 26th Street Green, gave a presentation about um, 26th Street Green. The main updates are really um, the city uh, mostly DOT has uh, selected a design based on the feedback that uh, I think they got 100 and some people to respond to their design input session. Um, and so um, they're going to start construction. I thought I understood them to have said that they have to conclude it by 
July 1st, um, which would be great. Um, but I think they, at a minimum, they have to start it by July 1st. So um, it should be really any time now that they start construction on that space. The other big update is that um, the Friends of 26 Street Green elected officers, um, adjacent neighbors are pretty well represented, but uh, everyone's really welcome to be participating in the organization. Um, we have seats open for board members. Uh, and then the third piece of information would be um, Friends of 26 Street Green also submitted a spruce up, um, mostly around shade. So we're trying to create a shade structure uh, that will um, while we wait for these trees to grow in over the next decade, create a little bit of um, shade in that space. But um, that space is, I think, is really seen a lot of great use during the, the COVID crisis. And uh, I'm sure we'll see even more good use this uh, summer. So come by and visit. Hey, let me just add, Kyle, let me amplify since Megan's not here. Um, what Nakia was saying was this this is a design build, which means the process is that they begin construction before they actually have the final plan. And she said, and I was this is what I was so worried about, was that we didn't want to let the timeline for this slip despite all the other urgencies, because they need to get this done under the current budget. And the budget year uh, goes through uh, July 1 and we start a new budget. So what Nakia was explaining was that they're going to go ahead and do their execution of the design that the community had um, voted on by July 1. So any of the other things that we're going to do as a community, like the grant work, that comes after. But nonetheless, it's by the first and any coordination we need to make sure that our, our like electrical or anything else is going to work. Let's just keep rolling with them and keep working with uh, the DPW folks to make sure this happens. And I think this is a really exciting development that the city's gonna move forward. And I also think it's important to get this project that everyone put, spent so much time on done now because um, uh, we don't know what happens after July 1 because we have a whole lot of other things, uh, many other challenges we're gonna face. So let's get this one done and then face the next challenge. So thank you for everything you've done. And, and I'm just wanted to clarify, it's, 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 on, it's on rocket speed right now and everyone support what they're doing and uh, um, just deal with the fact we've got a little bit of construction coming up right now. And so the last thing that uh, if you listen to the recording from the meeting, uh, CSX was there to talk about their work uh, to make the train line that runs through our neighborhoods uh, a double stacker. And there's one um, bridge that they have to re-engineer uh, in order to make that possible. There are a lot of details that I just won't even try to recap for you all, but if you want to hear about how that's going to happen, I would definitely uh, listen to that recording and uh, hear the timeline for that project. Yeah, I would just, just chime in one thing um, on that, Miller, which I think is it's, it's actually somewhat relevant, I think, to the, the, the Eli's presentation about um, potentially um, creating Guilford as a slow street, is that because of the CSX double stacking project, um, there is going to be a, um, a stop of, at 26th Street, the, the traffic will have to stop for an eight month period, starting somewhere in the 2021, 2022 period. They did a maintenance of traffic study. They're not, there's not going to be maintenance of traffic. There's going to be a detour. There's some more stuff in that presentation, but it is kind of interesting because, you know, here we've got another kind of like inevitable thing like uh, stopping traffic on that street. So I think um, it kind of makes the case that, oh, this is actually might be a, a, good, a good place for this uh, slow streets to happen as well. So, but I think uh, yeah, I'll, I'll include a link to the uh, CBCA um, meeting in the minutes uh, and uh, people can watch that section. There, there is a lot of detail in there. Miller, do we have an open seat at the CBCA that we need to fill as, as Harwood? Uh, Kirsch, not at the moment, right? But the not, not, not at CBCA. I, I want to make sure, do you guys have two representatives to CBCBD? The Benefits District has two seats for Harwood. And, and they're, they're currently filled. Good. So CBCA, no, that's basically, CBCA is a really big area and includes all the way over to Greenmont, both sides. Right. Right now, we are in the middle of our nomination committee work and as we uh, look to make sure that we have geographic diversity which is very important for CBCA. Um, if anyone wants to um, nominate 
to the CBCA Board of Directors, please speak up. And at any time, anyone in the large CBCA boundaries can be a member. So don't, don't be silent, speak up, reach out. And uh, if you don't jump onto the CBCA uh, website, then you know anyone can reach out to me and I'll get it over to our, our uh, nominating committee director, Janice Davis. So um, uh, please do uh, speak up now because we're trying to go ahead and line up with the board for the next year. And we tend to find it's really hard to get people who will commit. So um, anyone who's got good qualifications and capabilities, speak up because honestly, more is better. We really need people who will step up and do work just as Harwood needs them. And we, we overlap, so step up, do the work, and you can actually do both. I've been involved in more than one community association for many years, so let's keep keep it coming. Thanks, Kirsch. Um, next, I believe we have a CDCBD report out by Leslie. Is Leslie on still? Did she drop off? No, she's on. I think she comes back. Hey, oh, sorry, uh, my internet well, kicked out for a second. Um, yeah, we, and right when we came up to you as well, um, I was just yes. asking for a CVCBD report out. Yes, well, thank you for bearing with me last week. Uh, the board met and Christina gave a wonderful presentation to the community on the fiscal year 21 budget. And this is a revised budget that was not a part of the original presentation. And uh, this was unanimously, unanimously approved by the board uh, with the feedback taken after the first uh, community meeting. If you don't know much about the Charles Village Benefit District, it is generated a quasi um, a city uh, organization that collects tax revenue from their CERT tax dollars. So they primarily deal with um, safety, security, and sanitation. So um, sanitation workers are still working out there every uh, day and one flex day. They should be wearing their masks. And if they're not, uh, please let us know. You can email info at charlesvillage.org, I believe. And Christina is also on the call this evening if she wants to add anything. But we also do have an open spot starting July 1st. If you have any questions about what it would look like, usually it's a couple hours a month uh, attending uh, one uh, committee meeting and, and one board meeting and any events. Right now, a lot of those events and things have been put on hold, but um, it's generally well received and you get uh, greater knowledge of your community and uh, a voice in determining how um, the CB, CBD uh, go about initiating, uh, initiating programming. And uh, yeah, any comments or questions? Christina, did you have anything that you wanted to add to the CBCBD report out? No, I think Leslie did a great job. Um, I wanted to clarify is that the position available is a quad four rep position, which is normally um, an elected position in October, but the position will be available starting July 1st. And so it's not just hardwood, it includes parts of ABLE as well. And so, um, but it, so if you do know someone who may be interested in serving in the interim for that position, um, we are going to hold an election. Yeah, as, as Kirsch pointed out, we do have two representatives. I also serve on the CVCBD. Um, as Leslie was saying, I, I've really enjoyed serving on that on that board. It was one of the first boards that I've been a part of. Um, I think it would be a, a great board for anybody else that's uh, passionate about uh, crime and sanitation in the in, in, in our neighborhood. So um, reach out to me or Leslie or Christina if you're interested in joining and we'll, we'll get you plugged in where you need to be. Okay, I, I got a question. There, yes, sir. The, what? I said yes, sir. Yes. At the at the last general meeting, I I couldn't attend it, but I know there was 
there was planned to be a big change with um, with basically reducing the the hour attorneys hours and transferring that money to somewhere else I can't remember where and I just wanted to know what happened with that so Tony's Tony's position has been left completely intact there's going to be no change to his position for for next year there there's okay. no change in the proposed budget um, the original budget that was proposed did have some changes to that, but a lot of community input was received and we made some changes. Okay. And the other thing is, the it seemed like the budget for Wolf Security is enormous and they don't really do much. And I just wondered about that. Christina, do you want to speak to that? Or Tony? Uh, I, I, I don't know that I'm qualified to speak to what, what they make. Sure, no, it's so the budget is based on the number of hours that they provide. And so they pro are a seven day a week patrol um, from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. On, on five days a week. I mean, I'm sorry, to 3 a.m. five days a week. Um, and it also depends on the level of security. So we have one daytime officer who is unarmed and then two that are armed. Um, so it's actually a very competitive um, contract that we have with them. We've looked into other private security office, um, private security companies, and they are among the lowest uh, so far that we've seen. Um, but I think if the, this process will begin again very soon to talk about the budget for next year, this year will begin even sooner because it did seem like even though we've given community members many opportunities to be engaged in this process, um, people just still aren't paying attention. So I'm going to be doing a lot more outreach this coming year. That's um, great. Starting in the fall to make sure yeah. that people are completely aware of what it is that we're proposing and have better opportunities to speak up. Um, even though, I mean, we, I, I just need people to pay attention. So <laughs> if the wolf security line item is of concern to people, then we can have that conversation um, starting in the fall. Thank you, Christina. You're welcome. Yeah. Hey, I'd love to just add a real key point. Having been involved oh, in the CB, CBD board for six years, it's a really hard thing for many people to understand that the security is a costly function because these folks actually have a lot of credentials and if the community needs it, you you're going to have to decide what is the right proportion in order to afford it. Um, and uh, when you look at in terms of hours of boots on the ground, the sanitation gives you a lot more hours of boots on the ground. And Kish, Kish, I wasn't I wasn't concerned with that. I was concerned with whether they really had any effect on crime. Um, I really wasn't concerned about how it, how how qualified they were. Or anything like that. Sure. I just want to make sure people understood that trade because a lot of time it's been missed in, in past deliberations. Just yeah. And, add, I, and add I, I was on the board, so I, I know a lot of that. Yeah. Very good. So, so, so may I speak in? Um, Absolutely. Nick, to answer your question, number one, about certifications, uh, I just did a full report on their certifications and I check and I've actually been to their training and we went through a couple of uh, security outfits before we got to Wolf. Um, and then by checking on these security outfits, uh, some, uh, some of the times they weren't exactly where they were supposed to be. Um, but finding Wolf um, is a well-trained group. Their certifications are being checked on a regular basis now. Um, in fact, I just I just did them uh, Saturday or Friday or Saturday. I think it was. I checked the certifications that were emailed to me. So I, I wasn't I wasn't concerned with certification. I was concerned whether they had any effect on crime by sitting in one intersection or not. Right. Well, it seemed okay. like it was a particularly effective use of our funds. Right. I mean, we we, we keep them mobile. That's why they're in the vehicles, and. Um, it's really hard to judge without pulling security out of the area, whether they're affecting crime. But I think um, with them, with uh, partnership with the neighborhoods and responding to it, and each day they're giving an update in their post orders to what to look for, what to be, what crime patterns are taken care of. 
So I, I think they're doing an effective job. I really do. Uh, and I think that they do have an impact on crime, but unless we pull them out of the area, we can't really tell because we've always had, since I've been here, security teams in the area. And I think Wolf has been the most effective. And I said, and every morning I read their reports of where they are every hour, what they're doing every hour and, and, and inspecting them and their sheets and knowing what's going on in the neighborhood. I think it's, it's a huge plus than what we've had before. So I think they're making a difference. Nick, to your point, we'll have this, we'll start this conversation very soon. Good. And, and that's great. I just want to say, I will just, oh, no. I, I just want to add to what, what Tony was saying. What we had before, this is a huge delta from a much earlier rendition of security. It's, 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 I, I can see the effectiveness improve. Just want to say by comparison. Um, yeah. And I was disappointed before and I'm happier now. Excellent. I believe the last point that we have under community reports and discussion, actually we've got two left. Um, first, we've got three left, I'm sorry. First, we've got the East Harwood Catalyst Grant Report, Miller. Yeah, I'll just make it really quick. We are due to just turn in the revised budget to DHCD. Um, we canvassed the people in East Harwood who were current homeowners who were uh, eligible to receive or be a part of the the grant so um, we just need to turn in the new budget and then get things started I'll, that's sufficient for now thanks um, next up behind that the Maryland new direction job training uh, I know a lot of people are out of work and I, I anytime I get any job training stuff I, I do want to you know kind of make sure that it's blasted out to the community um, they have some virtual career training um, it's 30 plus hours of online industry, industry specific, specific training. I believe most of their stuff is around transportation. Um, they've had CDL classes in the past. Um, this looked more like forklift and, and that's that sort of thing related. Um, but there's no upfront cost for anybody. They've got job coaching, resume building and, and different things like that. Um, so if you know anybody that that information will be uh, with the notes for this. If you know anybody that's interested, feel free to pass that along to them. Um, the last item that I have under the community reports is the time bank. Um, Nick or Charlene, did you want to speak to that? Um, no, I, I don't. No? Okay. No, yeah. No, I, I don't. The only thing I can say about it is I think it's a good idea. Um, we don't, we don't have as much participation as we thought we would, but I think it's a great idea. Do you want to share with the community as a whole what, what that idea is? Uh, okay, so Time Bank is a, an online mechanism by which people can donate services or ask for services, and you get sort of like paid with time. So if I would say I would mow somebody's lawn, and it would take three hours, then I think I'd get three hours service. I don't, I'm not sure it's a one-on-one, -on -one, but I'd get a number of hours in the bank and I could buy somebody or it's sort of like a bartering system with time. You can, you can buy another service or barter for another service with your time. And, and there's some people on there with a lot of skills. You have to join it to be able to look at the, the um, offerings though. Gotcha. This is Ian Schlackman's, this is the thing Ian Schlackman put together, right? It's, it's. Yes. So, so who, no, no, yeah. this was um, Emil. Emil, I, oh, well, Emil was working on it. I think Ian Schlackman may have started it and then Emil uh, continued. So if you've ever watched who your independent is, many times our, our candidate, Ian Schlackman, is one of our independent candidates. And, um, the, the concept, though, is that anyone's time is worth equal, and so you can jump in and do your thing, and you get equal amount of hours from somebody else. And so if you just have skills that you think are valuable to others and you need help from other people, you jump in here and you do your, your share. And in, in general, it's kind of a, like, don't, don't deal with the whole tax system. Just go in and, and share labor. And a lot of people can take real advantage of that. It's, it's a real good thing. It sounds like a real good thing for right now. 
especially our current circumstances. So people should really think about how they want to plug in. Keith, what is the full name of it? So if people want to go on online and join. Um, that's everything that I had for it. Um, Let me see if I can, I'm going to look at my email and see if I can find the, find it to find the name of it. Yeah, I, I was looking back through my email and was really struggling to find information for some reason on that. Um, so moving forward, I know we're running a little bit over and I, I want to be cognizant of everybody's time. Um, we will have a lot of COVID-19 information and resources up. Um, I was on a, a call with Mary Washington and her team and they have uh, a group that they've put together where you can either volunteer or request services. Um, that information will be blasted out. Um, also, the University of Baltimore, um, I'm sorry, yeah, the University of Baltimore has started um, a Be Heard Baltimore survey. Um, a lot of this is in, has to do with uh, response to COVID-19. If you uh, have certain opinions about how this has been handled and you want to express those, feel free to go on BeHeardBaltimore.com um, and the University of uh, Baltimore is, is, is running that. Um, I believe that's the end of the agenda. Does anybody have any, uh, actually, I'm sorry, Gina, we, we missed you earlier. Are you able to, to hop on here? Okay. Hi, how are you? Doing well, we got you this time. I know it took uh, something. I was telling Tony, I said, something happens after six o'clock with my Wi-Fi, and it just goes nuts. So I, it's, it's real tricky, but I'm here. So thank you very much. Um, so hi, everyone. Hey, Tony and Christina. <laughs> um, I just want to say my name is Gina Clay and I am the Northern District Community Liaison with the State's Attorney's Office in Baltimore. So um, I came on board late last year so I kind of really started doing some things like mid-January so I'm really trying to touch bases with a lot of the communities in the Northern District so um, I can just get to know you and offer up the services of the State's Attorney's Office. So I'll make it kind of brief because I know you're a little over your time. Um, but I'm located at the Baltimore City Juvenile Justice Center. Um, that's where my office is because I do the community liaison work and I also work with the juveniles. I work with DJS for about five years. So I'm a good um, connection with DJS. And if anybody wants to know like the process or the steps that goes on there, but I will preface that with um, the majority of everything that happens in juvenile is confidential. So I can tell you the processes, but I can't tell you where, you know, a particular youth is in the stage of his, of the crime that he's done, like if he's detained, what his court date is, but I can definitely tell you the process without saying names. So if anyone has any questions about juvenile or anything, please, um, I can give you my email and you can shoot me something. Um, I just wanted to say with the state's attorney's office, um, a state's attorney Mosby, she's very involved with the, the community and what's going on, even during this COVID and the courts being closed. She, um, would, she loves to come to meetings, join you on you know, your live meetings. So if anyone ever wants, if there's big questions about a particular crime that happened in your neighborhood and you would just like a little more information on like how did that come about, the results, um, please let me know and I can put in a request for her to come in. And if it's open on her calendar, she will more than jump on a meeting in the, in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, it's not a problem. And speaking of the state's attorney, we have assistant state's attorney. So if there's any particular specific questions in, in regards to just say a process, um, we have deputies that can come and join in on the meetings as well. So again, just a little notice what you're looking for to be answered and I can forward that to everyone and we can definitely make sure they can come to one of the meetings or as many as you want, okay? Um, we have a human trafficking person that works in our office. His name is John. And he is wonderful. He does, he's been with the FBI, CIA, anything you could ever imagine, domestic and international. And he is full of knowledge. So if anyone has any questions about human trafficking, and if you ever want him to come just to give a quick talk to one of your meetings, he will as well join in on that and just let me know and I can touch bases with him. Um, something else we offer with the state's attorney's office is um, victim services. Um, so if you're unfortunately a victim of a crime and say we just had a gentleman who was a victim of a crime, he was assaulted and they broke his glasses during the process. So there, we are now in the process, our victim services office to help him replace his glasses. So that may not be like a big deal, but for some people that is a big deal. I wear glasses, so I know if someone broke mine, I really be in for it. 
So if anyone's ever been a victim um, or you know someone that has, we do have an office that can talk to you and let you know the services that we offer. Um, let's see. Um, something we've been working on, um, Tony, he, I keep mentioning Tony. Tony is wonderful. I really work well with Tony. And he came down to Annapolis and he testified um, in regards to the um, community impact statements. So I know there's victim impact statements, but there's also community impact statements. So if a person is a victim of a crime in your community, as we know, it doesn't just affect that one person, it does affect the entire community. So we're looking to have that passed, the legislation just have it passed where when a community does submit a community impact statement, um, that it's automatically submitted. So sometimes the judges or the magistrates, they can say, you know, yay or nay that, okay, we'll listen to this or, or we won't. We want it so it could be just as powerful as a victim impact statement. So a lot of the communities, if you know of a person that's been arrested and you know he's going to court and you want the court to know how it affected you, you can send me the victim impact, I'm sorry, the community impact statement and I can get it to the, the attorney that's handling that case. So then at the end of it, a lot of people don't think it makes a difference, but it makes a huge difference um, when it comes down to the final say. If a person doesn't live in your neighborhood, a judge could say from your community impact statement, stay out of that neighborhood. That's part of his condition. So it does, it does have some legs to it and it's very important. We can talk about that in further detail. Um, occasionally, but not occasionally, we're gonna be doing it more often, but we have the court in the community. That used to be something we did actually in the community, but now with the COVID, everything is online. So we already had one already and it was a really good turnout. And there's a different topic every time that we have it and there's different people that come out that can really give you really firm answers on whatever questions or whatever the topic is at that particular time so i can send out when we have another one i'll just send like a blast email so everyone will know and again it's online so you can just jump on and join in on that um let's see i think i think that's enough for this this time i know i've talked a little bit long but um but i do want to say one thing about the opening of the courthouses I know everything's at a standstill. So we got something from the um, chief administrative judge and they're working in phases at the courthouses. So there's five phases of reopening. So we've already, and we go by dates. So we've already gone past May 4th, June 5th. Um, nope, June 5th is only, it's only the first. June 5th is coming up. So that'll be the second phase. And then we have a few more dates after that. She's looking and everything can change because no one really knows what's going on with this virus, but she's looking to have complete opening by October 5th. But with the different stages, it's going to address different things. For example, non-jury trials, and then the next phase can be civil, family, juvenile, contested hearings. And then hopefully, hopefully by October 5th, everything is calm, we have a good understanding and we can be at full service by October 5th. Again, that can change because you never know what can happen, but those are kind of the phases and the dates that she's looking at at this time. So certain people, when they, whenever anyone comes into the courthouse, they're gonna be temperature checked by the deputies, fill out a small questionnaire. People can be turned away, you know, if there's an issue or something. So it's definitely a work in progress. So it's, it's one of those things where we're shooting for this, but that can change. So if anyone has any more questions about that, please shoot me an email as well. Uh, Gina, um, I did a quick Google for your contact information and I'll put it in the minutes. Is it gclay at statesattorney.org or state attorney? Is that the best way to people get in contact with you? Yes, exactly. State's attorney. State's attorney. Yeah. ST attorney. Gotcha. <laughs> okay, cool. And, and then it's like I got 443-263-8114. So that one's different. My, I oh. moved my office. It actually, everything's the same and it ends in 8120. 81. So 8120. Gotcha. Okay, cool. I'll put the information in the minutes and that way people can get access to that. Perfect. Thanks for the presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Gene. I really appreciate that. Charlene, did you have something you wanted to say? You're, you're on mute currently. Sorry. I have the name of the time bank. It's called Let's Be More. So it's L E T S, the letter B and then more, M-O-R-E, it's all one word. If you look it up online, it comes up and you can join it. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I believe Miller wanted to add something about water bills very quickly. 
Yeah, so I just wanted to make sure, I know that we were all um, really excited to get some of us get our water bills. Um, and I think some people rushed to pay them and I never got my paper copy. And I assume that you guys can see what we access online. And it's showing a lot of really bad information, which could be a problem down the line. Like it said, we haven't paid our water bill since um, July 19, 2016. Yeah. Um, not to mention that there's no way that this bill is right. And so I had a neighbor two doors down from me who paid her bill. She's like, yeah, we got it, we paid it. Then I sent her a text this morning. She's like, oh my gosh, it says 2016. And so, you know, if you were in a position where you were selling your home and they go through and they're looking for the bills were paid, you know, this is an inaccurate statement that could just cause a red flag. Um, but also, you know, even if I pay this 131.24, are they going to come back later and be like, whoopsie, we missed something. So I'm just saying, everybody, please pay close attention. It took them three months to generate this, or however long it took them. I'm just personally disappointed and just want everyone to be aware so you can protect yourself. That's it. Thank you. Hey, Miller, real quick question. Are we still, though, are we forgiven while they are failing to present us with our correct bills? We're forgiven a late payment until they give us the correct bill. Is that... Is that correct? Well, yeah, but uh, you know, now I want to know: Are they considering this the correct bill? Which I would say isn't. Exactly not. It's got to stay the correct billing period. Everything's got to be right. So it correct. Makes sense. And it's going to be steep because it was a long period, but it should right. still all make sense for a multi-month billing period with the correct dates. And I, I'm just saying that's the thing that's going to choke people. And if there's a way to get the word out that what you're saying, that should be something that many people should hear because many uh, people should speak up about yep. this this water bill fiasco is on my last nerve so it's my hope that everybody will write whoever you gotta write because i don't yeah never mind let me stop this call is being recorded no but, but it's good i'm just saying people should realize that you're not going to lose your house right now just at the time to ask the questions so that you can get your correct bill and then when you get your correct bill pay that bill that's what i think is important awesome did anybody else have any other comments open floor to anybody we ran a little bit over and i'm sorry about that but i think we had a lot of good information to share this this month um thanks everybody for being here uh this meeting is adjourned Okay, we're both recording. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.